Council Bluffs for a debate for the open seat in Iowa's 3rd Congressional District, which covers the southwestern part of the state. Democrat Stacey Apple, who served in the Iowa State Senate, she's running against Republican David Young, who's a former chief of staff to U.S. Senator Chuck Grassley. The winner of this race will replace Congressman Tom Latham, who's retiring. This comes to us courtesy of Iowa Public TV. Applicants. Nominees Democrat Stacey Apple and Republican David Young campaigning to fill an approaching vacancy in Iowa's 3rd District congressional seat. During the next hour, Young and Apple debating campaign issues in a special edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Iowa banks know you want honest advice about how to best reach your financial goals, whether it's financing and education, buying a new home, growing a business, or funding retirement. Iowa banks, Iowa values. MyIowaBank.com. Alliant Energy, working to help Iowa small businesses become more profitable with energy efficient heating, cooling, lighting, and more. Information is available at AlliantEnergy.com. Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about, for good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa Communications Network, the ICN is committed to the enhancements of distance learning and continues to meet the demands for greater access of high-speed internet by educational users. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond, celebrating more than 40 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa public television. Live from the Arts Center on the campus of Iowa Western Community College, this is a special debate edition of Iowa Press. Here is Dean Borg. Welcome to Iowa Western Community College in Council Bluffs. This is Iowa's third congressional district, stretching from central Iowa southwestward to the Missouri border and the Missouri River, too. And so that includes Des Moines to Council Bluffs and along the way, Creston, Red Oak, Shenandoah, and Atlantic. The district's incumbent congressman, Republican Tom Latham, isn't seeking re-election. So that makes it one of the 44 open seats in the U.S. House of Representatives. Democrats hoping to reclaim that seat are pinning those hopes on Stacey Apple. She's a former state senator, serving a term from 2006 to 2010. Republican David Young hasn't held elective office, but he has Capitol Hill experience as Senator Charles Grassley's chief of staff. Mrs. Apple, Mr. Young, welcome to this special edition of Iowa Press. Great to be here. And of course, you're familiar with our traditional format, but we're in a different setting here in Council Bluffs with a live audience in addition to our television viewers. And they here in the audience have agreed not to cheer during the debate. And uh, we're following our regular Iowa Press formats. That means no debate rules. That means no opening or closing statements. Just ideas and issues. I'll be moderating and questions will be coming from political journalists, Des Moines Register columnist Kathy Obradovich and Radio Iowa News Director Kay Henderson. Let me just say, uh, Mr. Young and Mrs. Apple, before we begin, this, we're be producing this debate on September 11th, the anniversary of 9-11. There are half-mast flags flying throughout the nation today. I'm wondering, Mrs. Apple, where were you on 9-11? Well, I happened to be feeding, when I found out the news, I was feeding my third child on our couch with my uh, two-year-old son sitting beside me. And how has 9-11 changed your life? Well, I think it's made us uh, more cognizant of the whole world and knowing that it's, you know, it's a dangerous world. And I remember today we were, I was driving the two kids into school and we went by Gray's Lake and the flags are all over. Um, it looks hundreds of flags there. Mm -hmm. And it was really, um, it was really moving to think of all those lives that were lost that day and the families that uh, were left behind and the first responders. 
you know, that went in there and tried right. to, so. Mr. Young, where were you? I was sitting at my desk on Capitol Hill and uh, in an office and I saw the first glimpse of all this on, on my TV at my, my desk and someone called over and said, turn on the TV. It looks like someone's flown into the World Trade Center. And I saw that and right then when the second one hit, you knew that there was a problem. And, it changes your life. Because, How has it changed your life? Well, you, you want to live every day to the fullest because you never know uh, when it can be your last day. And you want to make sure that those that, that you love, your family, your friends, you spend valuable time with them and you make sure that they know uh, that you care for them. We'll start the questioning with Kay Henderson. 13 years on, terrorism still exists. President Obama this past week announced that he has authorizes airstrikes into Syria. Mr. Young, do you think Congress should vote to authorize those strikes, or do you think the president has authority to do as he has done? Well, the president has outlined uh, in the War Powers Act of 1973 that he has those powers. And you hear many members of Congress say that and acknowledge that he does have that. But I think Congress needs to buy into this uh, to be consulted for authorization and appropriations, because when the president and Congress work together on issues, especially such as this, national security, it's very important. I think Congress needs to be involved. How would you vote were you a member? Uh, well, I don't get classified uh, briefings or have that intelligence information, but I would make sure that I was on the floor or listening to the debate at every moment. Um, I'll turn to you. How would you approach this as a member of Congress, and do you think the president has the authority to act on his own? I think he has the authority to act whenever there, our homeland is threatened. And I think we are threatened with ISIS. Um, I do believe the way that he's put forward um, the airstrikes and the humanitarian aid and uh, working with folks on the ground um, makes sense and the training. So I approve of how he's done it. Uh, she mentioned uh, working with people inside the state of Syria. Mr. Young, do you agree that it's a good idea to arm and train people inside Syria? Well, we need to make sure we know who we, we are arming and what side we're all on. Um, you know, when the president spoke last night, um, for months that he had been indecisive, I did see some, uh, some resiliency in him last night. He talked about not just demeaning or managing this crisis and this threat of ISIS, but he talked about destroying it. And I was happy to hear that word finally because I thought it was long overdue. Ms. Apple, one final question on this subject. Uh, Congressman Dave Lopesack, who sits on the Armed Services Committee, said it's really hard to tell who the good guys and the bad guys are in Syria. He's concerned about that component of the president's proposal. It sounds as if you do not share those concerns. Well, I do share those concerns. We just need to make sure we're working with the right people and arming the right people. Um, we need to work with people that um, want to defend their own freedom. And, and so that takes time and working and, and listening to the folks on the ground. You mentioned uh, a security interest for the United States. There, the president last night talked about, um, you know, the, the, there have been threats um, and that there, the ISIS might pose some future security threat to the United States. Um, do you think that that is a sufficient uh, American interest to get more involved militarily in that region, or are there other interests as well that are involved here? This is Apple. So ISIS is, you know, it's growing and it's taken over two really weak countries and we need to make sure, you know, I look at it as a mom. I want to make sure my homeland, my, my state, my, my family is protected. So I appreciate what the president is doing. And, and Mr. Young, do you feel like American interests are sufficiently represented in this action? Is there going to be um, enough, um, uh, is there enough of a threat actually to the United States to justify this? And um, are there other interests in the United States that, um, that the president should be paying attention to? Well, the, it, it, the threat is big and it's getting bigger and it's getting larger and ISIS is on the move. They're, gonna, they're looking to overtake Baghdad. I believe that they want to go south from the news reports that I've heard and what I've read. They want to they want to grasp control of the oil fields in the Middle East. Imagine if they harness that and what that could do to the price of fuel around the world, what that could do to the pocketbooks of Americans, what could that, that could do to our economy. But more importantly, these terrorist thugs are trying to come to America. There's homegrown terrorism here. We're getting reports about it. We need to be vigilant in all angles, overseas and here at home. But what does that mean 
if you were elected to Congress and sitting there now, what would you be urging? Uh, I'd be urging our State Department to revoke the passports of those that they suspect who, are, who have admitted that they're a part of ter terrorist organizations. Our State Department has that authority. Right now they're not doing it. They're, they're guising it under the, the gauge of religious freedom. That's absurd to me. And Mrs. Apple, what would you be doing if you were sitting in Congress now? Well, Congress has the role of oversight. Do they need to make sure that what we're working what on... What would you be urging? I would, I would not be urging re, re, um, taking away their passports. I think we need to make sure that we work through the system and look through it on a very uh, diligent basis. Let's move to from being the world's policeman, if you will, to perhaps being the world's doctor. There's an Ebola outbreak in Africa. Mr. Young, what role should the U.S. play in outbreaks such as this? Has there been not enough done uh, to, to curb the threat of a pandemic? Uh, th this is so new, this pandemic uh, that could possibly be right here in the, our backyard across the river in Omaha. There's a biocontainment unit and there's a, a patient there with Ebola. Um, it's kind of unnerving, it can be, because what happens if this gets out? Uh, I believe we need to push forward with the vaccination as fast as we can. Um, the FDA has a role in that. The CDC does. We need to work with other com countries as well. We need to expedite this. Does Congress need to provide more money for those efforts? Um, if they're asked, possibly. I'm not sure that there's been a request. And you said it's unnerving for uh, Dr. Sacra to be over the river, over in a hospital in Omaha. Is it inappropriate? Uh, I don't know if it's inappropriate because I think the, probably the best treatment is right here in, in uh, America. Uh, same question to you. What sort of role should the U.S. play in these uh, horrific outbreaks that are occurring elsewhere? They haven't yet reached our shores. Well, it's a humanitarian effort. It's a huge humanitarian. We have the best scientists in the world here in our country. And coupled with that, we should, that's what we should be working on. What about the, the fact that the doctor who contracted Ebola was flown here to the Midwest for treatment? Are you fine with that? That doctor is a U.S. citizen. He should be here. We should be taking care of him. His family wants him taken care of. We talk about the U.S. role in healthcare around the world, but um, health care here in the United States still hasn't been entirely sorted out. Um, what is your position on the future of uh, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. Are there things in that law, uh, Ms. Apple, that you would like to fix? Well, of course there's things that need to be fixed, but... Such I, as? So I would say it's everybody's right to have uh, access to health care. Um, I think there's great things within the Affordable Care Act, uh, making sure that big insurance companies cannot take away uh, your insurance coverage just because you have a pre-existing condition. I look at it as a mom um, thinking about, uh, you know, a child being diagnosed with leukemia or cancer, and then being told the next day that no longer do they have coverage. But you had the opportunity in Congress to fix this law. Um, what what is it that you think would be, need to be fixed? One of the things that I think is, if you were told that you could keep your insurance coverage, you should keep it. Another thing that we should be able to do is uh, with Medicare. Um, we should have been able to negotiate drug prices, just like the VA does. That would save billions of dollars. Um, but what we shouldn't be doing is repealing it. I've traveled the country for, or the state for the last 15 months. I've never had one person say they want to repeal the law. What they've had said is we need people that want to get together and fix it. I think it's atrocious that we have spent 50 times to vote to repeal it. We should spend 50 times trying to fix things that need to be fixed, work together. And, and Mr. Young, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of Republicans have uh, said repeal the law. I think you've said repeal and, and replace, correct? Um, what, what is it that uh, you would replace Obamacare with? Uh, I, I think it's a bad law. I thought it was a bad process. Uh, it was a very partisan process. I wish this could have been uh, a bill, a law that both sides could have come together and it would have been voted on maybe in the Senate 90 to 10 or 90 percent in the House as well, but it didn't. And so we're stuck with it. Do you it's think it's here. before you before I before you sure. go on? Do you think it's fixable, or does it have to be repealed and start over? Well, when the president delays parts of it, it's hard to tell if we're ever going to see if it ever comes into place, so it so it can stand on its own merits, or if it is fixable or not fixable. But we had a president who said, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your insurance, you can keep it. Your 
health insurance premiums won't go up, and we're seeing the reverse of that. Iowans are, are telling me every day in my visits with them that they've got real problems with this. Uh, it's hurting relations, rela relationships between employers and employees, between okay. doctors and patients, and you want solutions. Yeah, Yeah. so, yeah. Why the, so what are the solutions to that? And, and again, does that start yeah. with repealing, or can you fix, can you fix it? It's not going to be able to be repealed as long as we have this president. This is his, you know, keynote legislation, his keynote law, and it's going to be there for the long haul. I would have dropped those barriers around the state line so people could have shopped for insurance across the state lines, much like they do for car insurance or homeowners insurance. That would have brought down the price. We need price transparency. Consumers need to know what they're paying for before they go into the doctor, before they see their provider, and not wait to see the sticker shop shock afterwards. Did you favor the expansion of Medicaid, which was included in Obamacare? It seems to be working in Iowa, and I would make sure that in any regards to Medicaid, they have some kind of flexibility, but... Mrs. Apple, Medicaid, should it have been expanded? Was yes. that good? Yes, we have more women, we have more children getting coverage. Would you expand it still further? You know, if need be, we would. Let us turn to what occurred in Washington, D.C. last October. There was a debt ceiling vote, and Republicans, such as yourself, Mr. Young, decided that let's push this, try to get President Obama to capitulate in regards to the Affordable Care Act. Should you become a member of Congress, would you tie future votes to raise the debt ceiling to some other issue, or would you vote on a standalone prospect of raising the debt ceiling? Well, first of all, you have to take a look at how we got there. We're not doing budgets. We're spending money. It's out of control. And I've outlined some budget principles, such as auditing the federal government so we know where the waste, fraud, abuse, mismanagement is, the duplication, so we can cut those programs, um, sunsetting legislation, a balanced budget amendment. But when it comes to the debt ceiling, you know, over 40 times in the past, I think, 30 years, there have been other items that have been tied to the debt ceiling. And I think there are some opportunities where you, you, would, you could add that. Uh, maybe it's the Keystone Pipeline, something like that. Maybe tax simplification. Uh, we're seeing corporations go overseas because of corporate tax inversion, maybe lo a lowering of the corporate tax rate. But I think it's, uh, it would be healthy to, to get something out of this uh, for those who are, are not in favor of, of raising the debt ceiling. Ms. Apple, should you become a member of Congress, would you vote to raise the debt ceiling? Is there a point at which you would say, okay, the credit limit has been reached? Um, and also address the issues that he brings up, tying future debt ceiling report, uh, votes rather to other issues. Well, I think once again, we need to work on um, where the money is being spent and how it's being spent. When I was in the state Senate, I did the government reorganization. I became the chair of state government. And I, um, we worked with Democrats, Republicans, uh, uh, the Senate, the House, managers of departments, uh, uh, employees, citizens, and we found ways to save money for the Iowa taxpayers. That we sounds to me like you efficient. wouldn't be in favor of raising the debt ceiling without some cost savings uh, being in that bill. Dean, what I think is we have so much gridlock and we have people that are, um, elected that are not working and they're not doing their job and they need to sit down and work together and do their job so we don't we're not coming to a shutdown they should be working to do their job that's what we need to elect speaking of spending money um, th there are a lot of infrastructure problems in this country um, uh, not just potholes in in the road but um, problems with the uh, the electrical grid um, all kinds of, of infrastructure um, Mr. Young, if, if you were in Congress, what priority would you give to infrastructure improvements? And would you consider any sort of revenue such as a gas tax increase to help pay for that and, and have the users pay for it? Well, for roads and bridges, the gas tax just isn't doing it anymore because we have so many new vehicles out there that are not fueled by gasoline. You have electric, um, propane, natural gas, and so I believe that we need to have a long-term solution, be very creative, and make sure that the users of those other vehicles who are using our roads and bridges um, pay a user fee. And, and what is that solution? Is it is it toll toll roads or? I wouldn't go with toll roads. Uh, but I think it would be something in the line of a of a, of a gas tax um, compared to like how much fuel that they they put in their vehicle or maybe by wattage. I don't know, but we need to have the 
we need to not kick this can down the road like we've been doing, where the highway trust fund is de depletes, and then we we'll throw our hands up in the air saying, oh no, what do we do right now? Ms. Apple, would you raise the gas tax to pay for um, highway repairs across the nation? Um, and uh, are there, what other a commitment would you make to repairing infrastructure in a time when budgets are tight? Well, I, I do not support raising the gas tax. Our middle class Iowans and their families cannot afford any more taxes. Um, you know, where our infrastructure is crumbling. Here in the third district, we have some of the, the worst bridges and roads that need to be fixed. This is a budgetary issue and it's a priority and we need to start making it in those budgets. Well, I mean, just about every dollar spent in Washington is, is red ink. Do you borrow um, to pay for infrastructure repairs, knowing that um, there, there would be jobs created in, in, in doing those repairs around the country? I think it's something that you have to sit down and look at the budget, line item by line item, and make your priorities. And this is a priority. Infrastructure is a priority here in Iowa. But uh, something else, what Kathy is saying, that something else has to go then. And so if you're going to devote money to infrastructure and roads, then you're taking it away from something else or you're going deeper in debt. Where well, are you going with this? Well, I think you just have to sit down, look at the budget, and find your priorities. That's what we did in the state senate. We worked through it, every line item by line item, and found, found ways that we had priorities and effective efficiencies that we can find. You wouldn't raise the gas tax. Uh, I forgot, what did you say about the gas tax? Uh, the Young? gas tax alone, the way it is, it, it's not doing the job because we have so many other vehicles out there. We need some equity with the other vehicles out there that are using our roads and highways. So would you be in favor of raising the gas tax if, if need be then? Uh, we need to have that debate first, but I, our state legislature also needs to have that debate as well. The United States Senate passed a, what they called a comprehensive immigration reform bill. The House did not act. If you are elected to the House, what sort of immigration plan would get your vote? Uh, one that protects the border first and foremost um, and secures the border. And in the Senate bill, the, pre, the, the bill gave the delegate delegation of authority to the Department of Homeland Security to certify whether or not that border was secure. Uh, I, I didn't trust this president. Uh, I may not trust any other president to just have somebody willy-nilly in a in bureaucracy say it's secure. I think Congress needs to have skin in the game. They need to go down and visit that border uh, and vote on whether or not it's secure or not. And we may need to make sure that we reform our legal system. Would people be coming in here the way they are um, illegally if it was maybe easier to come in legally with visa reform. Uh, it, it's a challenge we have, it's a problem we have, but we live in the greatest country of the world still, and we have to put a human face on this. People are coming over here to better their lives, I understand that, uh, and I believe in a guest worker program as well. Do you um, either fault or favor the business community's effort in regards to passing immigration reform? Do you think there needs to be more workers brought into the country than the native born? Well, it depends on how our economy is and the need for the workers at any one time. Um, and the immigration levels that we let in, um, <coughs> you may have to match those up to what our unemployment rate is or where the needs are for certain workers. Ms. Apple, immigration reform. President Obama has delayed what was rumored to be executive action on his own to address this issue. If you become a member of Congress, do you think that Congress should act instead of the president? No, I think Congress should act. And we have a bipartisan bill that's sitting on uh, Speaker Boehner's desk. It, uh, it increases the border control by over 22,000 um, individuals. It, uh, it creates the DREAM Act. It also uh, provides a pathway of citizenship for our 11 million undocumented workers. We have a piece of legislation that's ready to go. What we need is people that want to go up there and do the work. You need to do the work that's in front of you. So you think President Obama has the authority to act on his own in this regard, or do you think Congress needs to set the policy? I think Congress and the President need to work together, but right now we have a, a Congress that does not work and we need to change that. Mr. Young, what about the undocumented young adults, children, uh, under 10 years old, some of them, coming to the United States over the border and trying to find either relatives here or a place to live? Should Iowa or in some way the federal government be involved in finding them a place to live? Well, you have to put a face on this. I mean, these are children and they're separated from their families uh, in Central America. 
and it's heartbreaking. I mean, you see some of the video and the pictures and hear some of the stories of what's happening, but I know this to be certain. I do believe that governors need to be notified uh, when these children uh, are, are dropped into our state or any state. And I want to make sure that these kids are taken care of. I mean, there's, some, there's health needs uh, from their own needs as well as could they have um, some communicable disease as well that could uh, be harmful to the public. I hear you saying some humanitarian things, and that is, do I hear you saying, let's take care of them, they're here, let's take care of them and settle them and find them a place to live and not send them home? I want to match them up with their families in Central America and make sure that they they are with their families. And I think we also need to lean on our, our southern neighbor, Mexico, to lean then on their southern border to make sure that their borders are secure. Mrs. Apple, send them home or resettle them here? Well, there's a process. We, <clears throat> we need to find out you know, how they got here, why they came. Are they refugees? So if they have true refugee status, um, you know, Iowa has always been very welcoming to refugees. Are you? I am. And you know, if they're true refugee status, you know, I, I'm a mom. I'm a mom of six. Uh, I can hardly imagine how hard it must be as a mother to send your child over, you know, miles and miles. I mean, I'm hearing from from teachers and parents in communities, and they're saying, we, you know, we have enough needs to take care of, you know, in our municipalities and schools to take care of our own children here, and it's just another layer of burden. So it's really hard to to make sure that everybody is taken care of. But we need to take care of our children first. I ask that question because you're seeking to identify yourselves to third district congressional voters. And as you're seeking to do that, there are others who are running commercials doing it for you negatively. And we have a couple of those commercials. And Mr. Young, first one about you. I can't wait. After 20 years in Washington, David Young says, I've seen the ugly of Washington, D.C. I've been caught by its trappings. Caught by its trappings. Maybe that's why Young wants to give more tax breaks to big corporations and billionaires and pay for it by slashing funding for schools and eliminating the Department of Education because David Young got caught up in Washington. He'll never work for Iowa. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee is responsible for the content of this advertising. Mr. Young, that was a comment that was made on Iowa Press you bet. Yeah, when I you remember were a guest it. on yeah. Iowa Press. And really, the, the key word there, there is the operative phrase is, and uh, campaigning uh, and been caught, I've been caught by its trappings. Sure. That's, that's the phrase. Now, that brings up the question, are you campaigning as a Washington insider, I know the system so I can get things done, or are you campaigning as an outsider that we, I send me there and I'll change things? Well. First of all, can I comment on that commercial? I find it very laughable. Uh, you see these happen all the time, these attack ads. Words are taken, uh, parsed out of, of paragraphs and sentences. I have seen Washington, D.C. up close, and it's ugly. And you can get caught in a bureaucratic, massive, big government maze trying to penetrate it. Uh, there are traps sometimes where you're banging your head against the wall, but you find ways to be creative and advocate and penetrate it on behalf of Iowans, and I have done so, and I will never run away from my service for Iowa alongside Senator Grassley, working in day in, day out, being on the phone with the Iowans, hearing their heartaches, their problems, their solutions, being in meetings with them, seeing their tears at times when the EPA or the IRS is coming down on them, and that's why I want to go to Washington. Uh, Mrs. Apple, those opposing your candidacy want voters to know some things about you too. When your family makes its budget, what are your priorities? The mortgage? Groceries? When Stacy Apple voted to spend your tax dollars, she had different ideas. On the eve of the Great Recession, Apple voted to spend $120,000 on decorative flower pots at the state capitol. And Apple voted to spend $80,000 to repair an organ. Stacy Apple's spending priorities? Uh, they're a little off key. The National Republican Congressional Committee is responsible for the content of this advertising. Mrs. Apple, uh, you catch the drift there. It's big spending, flower pots. You said you'd set priorities, spending priorities, and yet the commercial says she spent money for flower pots and repairing an organ. Well, it's, this is a negative ad that they try and uh, take away from what my record actually is and the smaller parts of it. Um, 
my record is about creating preschools for every four-year-old in the state of Iowa, reorganizing state government, government and saving millions of dollars, uh, creating uh, equal pay for equal work in the statewide smoking ban. Those are big pieces of legislation. Are those votes that are in that commercial votes you wish didn't exist? You know, it, 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 they both were vetoed on it. Uh, the Oregon was a matching program with Senator Grassley when my opponent was his chief of staff. So, um, we, I think I need to point out too, neither of you are paying for those negative ads against each other. They're coming from outside sources. You're correct. This is what's unfortunate during the campaign when you have outside groups come in and do this and you can't coordinate with them, you can't control it. But, but those votes are real. I mean, that shows a contrast between me and my opponent. She voted for the largest budget in the state's history, which had to be bailed out by federal stimulus funds. And she talks about reorganization and oversight, and those are new words to me from her because she voted against the state accountability office at the time. And we need to be watching our government every day, day in and day out, from the local, state, and federal level. Can I talk, Go just and respond to that because, I, and I was interested in that question about the government accountability office as well. I mean, wasn't that adding um, more government bureaucracy in a bill that was supposed to be organizing and making government more efficient? Yes, it was, and you know, we I joined with a bipart. It was an amendment, and I joined with. Uh, bipartisan, the Democrats and Republicans against creating an accountability office. We already Whose have... Whose idea was that, to create a government accountability office? It was the Republicans. Um, I'm not sure which individual, you know, put the amendment forth. Um, but we already have, and at that time we had a Republican auditor that was doing a pretty great job, and to increase government was not what we were going for. But this is an investment. Every dollar put in for accountability, you get so much in return. I mean, I have a direct experience in this as Senator Grassley's chief of staff oversight in watching this government and some of the fraud, waste, and abuse and mismanagement that comes out of there, whether it's military contracting or uh, over reimbursements in the Medicare program. And those that save taxpayers dollars, and we need to save it at every level. And this is what we did with the government reorganization. We made sure, and we went through department by department, and we found ways to make government more effective and efficient. And uh, we also put forth that every, every other year we would go through and in the interim do it again. Well, let, let me ask you this. Uh, I mean, we've just heard uh, each campaign trying to define each of you. Uh, and most people who live in this district probably don't know you very well. So starting, starting with you, Mr. Young, how do you define yourself? Uh, what is the, this person that uh, you want these folks to send to Washington, D.C.? Uh, I'm somebody who knows how to listen. Um, I cannot be a better advocate for Iowa if I don't know what people are thinking. Now, my mouth is open right now, but usually when I'm in the, the towns in the 3rd District, I'm asking questions because Washington, D.C., as we have seen, does not have all the answers. Uh, I'm somebody who remembers who my boss is. Uh, should I be honored and humbled to be elected to the 3rd District as the congressman? I will remember who my boss is. And we see what happens when people go to Washington and they go wayward. Look what happened to Eric Cantor. He was a you know, House Majority Leader, and he just lost a primary because he forgot who he was. He forgot who his boss is, the people in his district. I will never forget who they are. Uh, I'm someone who believes that the best government is the government that governs closest to the people. Mrs. Apple, how do you introduce yourself to Iowans who have never heard of you before? That I'm a very independent thinker that is a result of getting things done for the people of Iowa. Um, and I know that Democrats don't have all the right ideas, Republicans don't have all the right ideas. I learned that in my service in the state Senate. And, uh, and that's what I bring to the table. When you talk about your experience, um, you know, your experience as chief of staff, um, your experience as a state senator, um, you know, it, it, people don't have very much of a voting record with both of you. You, you served a term. Um, you didn't take votes. Um, why should somebody, Mr. Young, why, why should somebody trust that you're going to do what you say you're going to do? Well. I can hit the ground running. And I would say that uh, if you want to know what kind of person I am, call Senator Chuck Grassley. He's somebody who Iowans trust, 
and he knows, and, and they know that he wouldn't have a chief of staff or any staff that he didn't trust. And so I would just add that. I can hit the ground running for Iowa. We have so many challenges in Washington, D.C. I want to be at the table. I know who the honest brokers are. I know what can be done and how to get it done. And I want to represent Iowa and help take care of these problems. Mrs. Mr. Young, what differentiates you then from Mrs. Apple? I think uh, two things that I just mentioned, a contrast in our philosophy. I like balanced budgets. I like uh, keeping an eye on this federal government. She voted against the state government accountability office and voted for the largest budget in Iowa's history. And that doesn't fare well to Iowans. Iowans hate debt. I hate debt. I want to take care of debt in Washington, D.C. Mrs. Apple, um, he said that uh, you aren't for balanced budget. He inferred that. Uh, is that true? I don't think so. Uh, we Here in the state of Iowa, we have to balance our bu budget every single year. Well, what differentiates you then from David Young? Well, I think that my service for the state of Iowa, uh, my background being a mom, I'm a six, uh, being a financial consultant for 12 years, working with families, trying to help them with their retirement and putting their kids through college. Um, there's a lot of differences between myself and uh, uh, Mr. Young. Uh, you know, I would not have uh, been that for the government shutdown. He is. He wants to repeal the Affordable Care Act. I do not. You said be a mom. Is that playing the card of let's send a woman to Congress? Well, I think you want to send the most independent thinker that's willing to work hard for the middle class families of Iowa. That's what you're looking for. Would you vote to pass a balanced budget amendment to the U.S. Constitution? I think we need to have a balanced budget that carves out for uh, Social Security and Medicare. So you would vote if it had those conditions to amend the U.S. Constitution requiring a federal way balanced budget? I do not believe I would. Okay, let's move on to something. I would. I'll just add that. <laughs> um, many so, Iowans are watching. Just a minute, Kate. You would what? I would vote for a balanced budget amendment if it uh, allowed for um, to make sure that in wartime uh, there could be a possibility of busting those caps if there are emergencies where we had to protect our homeland, things like that, and we had to make sure that our priority uh, was the mandatory spending, uh, the benefits that folks received. Social Security and Medicare. Let me just flesh you know, this out. A balanced out. budget amendment could be a 20% across the board cut. That would affect Social Security, Medicare, uh, our education budgets. We have to be extremely careful when we do things like that. That's why you make sure the mandatory spending is a priority. Iowans who are watching their television sets and listening to their radios are hearing a lot of ads for the United States Senate race. And in that race, there is a focus on issues which neither of you have focused upon tonight. That would be Social Security, Medicare, and the Veterans Administration. Let's start with Social Security and Medicare. Um, Ms. Zappel, how would you solidify, make those systems solvent? Well, you know, I would keep my promise to seniors and the 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds that are paying into the system. Uh, Social Security and Medicare is not a goal, it's a promise. The best way to shore up uh, Social Security and Medicare is to create great paying jobs so there's more people paying into the system. And that's, a, that's the best way to do it. I also think taking a look at Medicare, I think we spoke about it earlier, is being able to negotiate drug prices, just like the Veterans Administration does. It would save billions of dollars. You know, this is pretty personal to me. My mom called a couple months ago and said her doctor wanted to put her on a new prescription, but it was $1,000 a month for the copay. She says, I can't afford that. I can't even afford $500 a month. And I bet there's lots of other families just like that across the state of Iowa. So beyond those ideas, you wouldn't vote to, for instance, raise the retirement age. You wouldn't vote to, for instance, require wealthier Americans to contribute more above the cap on their income pay, perhaps Social Security's taxes on their entire income? You know, when I was a financial consultant sitting at kitchen tables, um, we made plans with the promise of Social Security being there for them, Medicare being there for them. And so how do you make it solvent if you don't make any changes? Well, just like I just said, we need to create great paying jobs for our middle class families and making sure that more people are paying into the system. That okay. makes it solvent. Mr. Young, how would you change the system? Well, I want to make it clear that we need to make sure that we keep that promise. Uh, and those are not entitlements. Those are benefits that Americans have paid into. 
you have to ask yourself, how did we get here? If this, if a trust fund was, was uh, pillaged on Wall Street, like Bernie Madoff did, uh, he'd be thrown into jail. But for some reason, our trust fund can be raided and, and there seems to be no, nothing happens. We need to make sure there's a lock on that. But we need to do what conservative President Ronald Reagan did, along with liberal Speaker of the House Tip O'Neill did. And they got together and they put everything on the table. Uh, so Republicans would... and Democrats alike, they want to, are saying, not all of them, are saying, let's, this is an American problem now. And then you can take things off the table. I would take raising the retirement age right away off the table. Ms. Apple? I would make sure that we look at, um, I think the, the wealthier Americans may have to forego, but you have to have solutions. And I want to be at the table to make sure that Iowans are heard. Another issue that is... No, uh, Mrs. Apple wanted to respond. Oh, thank you. You know, um, it's interesting to hear my opponent say those things because he's talked about privatizing Social Security. He's applauded that. Um, and, uh, you know, changing Medicare as we know it. Um, I think seniors need to know where he stands on these issues. Can you quote where I said I wanted to privatize Social we Security? Will, you applauded it. And I will make sure that after, after that we will give all the, the citations. I'd like to know when I said that. Is that off the table for you? Um, any sort of private it's, account? It's become such security? a political issue. It's amazing that so many Americans, when they want to get a better investment on their dollar, they look to mutual funds or stocks. But it's been so politicized, it's going to be taken off the table. Well, and, as and a financial consultant, I know, and we saw how our, a lot of our 401ks and our retirement plans went way down. I don't see how we can afford to privatize Social Security. So you would keep Social Security. Let me be clear now. Yes, sir. Uh, where, where would you put Social Security? You're not in favor of raising the retirement age. No. You want to keep the traditional pay as, uh, as you go Social Security without the option of putting it into 401k type plans. Return, yes, absolutely. So how would Social Security be uh, under your vote? How would it be? Yes. Just like it is right now, we need to make sure we keep that promise to our seniors. And how would you pay for it? Just like I, just, I said prior, we need to make sure we're creating good paying jobs so there's more people paying into the system. It and good paying the, jobs means setting the minimum wage where? Setting the minimum wage to $10.10 an hour. I, one of my very first bills that I voted on in the state senate was to increase the minimum wage to $7.25 an hour. But folks, that was seven years ago and those folks deserve a raise. The federal minimum wage? Yes, sir. Uh, where would you set it, Mr. Young? I think it's time to raise the minimum wage. Well, you have to do it in a way that Congress have done it in the past in a bipartisan effort where you make sure you're also uh, keeping in mind the small businesses out there that employ 70% of the workforce out there. It's time we need to make sure we, we uh, tie it together and we need to make sure that uh, the main streets in our smaller cities here, they thrive. Well, give, give, me, give me a dollar figure, 10, 10? 10, 10 seems to be. And, and by tying it together, um, I mean, how do, you, how, do you, how do you consider small businesses um, that are having to, having to pay the minimum wage? What, what consideration would you have in the law for them? Well, in the, in the just reauthorize it the same way it's been done in the past where there has been some tax incentives and tax credits for small businesses. But when you said tie it together, are you saying that it should be indexed in the future? I'm saying that uh, the raise with the tax credits should be in one piece of legislation. So you want some sort of comprehensive package that would raise the minimum wage and also redo corporate taxes? Uh, not corporate taxes, just for small businesses. Okay, just for small business businesses. Now, it is uh, interesting, though, but my opponent has always been against the minimum wage until this evening. Increasing the minimum wage. Is this a new, new position for you? No, I, I believe wage? I spoke on Iowa Press that I was open to it, and I spoke on Iowa Public Radio, so. Oh, I, I mean, aren't, uh, you're, I you're, a, lot of your, a lot of your fellow Republicans say this is a job killer. Um, do, you, do you not agree with that? Well, the CBO has said half a million jobs could be lost, but with the small business tax relief like it's been done in the past, it seems to offset that, they say. The renewable fuel standard is under debate, it seems, um, every month in the heartland and in Washington, D.C. Do you support continuing the renewable fuel standard, and how long should it be maintained, Mr. Young? Uh, I do support continuing the standard. Uh, what I do not support is the EPA 
meddling with it because the standard has been set into law. And if it's going to be changed, it should be done uh, through Congress. Um, it's hard. To, I don't have a crystal ball and can't tell at what stage you, you remove that standard, if you remove it at all. But it probably will be removed someday because I believe that our industry, ethanol industry, will get to the level of where it will be competitive uh, at the pump with other fuels. Ms. Apple, would you maintain the renewable fuel standard forever, or do you foresee a point at which it could be removed? You know, our economy, Iowa's economy, depends on the renewable fuel standards. Our farmers and their families de depend on it. And so I truly support it, and we need to make sure we send somebody that truly supports the renewable fuel standards here. Unfortunately, my opponent has stated uh, numerous times that he wants to phase out the renewable fuel standards. I didn't hear him say that tonight. He did not say it tonight. It's interesting. <laughs> well, you... What about what he said to have, have this go through Congress instead of it being an administrative rule um, through the EPA? Um, it, would it be a good idea to have Congress decide what uh, standard there should be for renewable fuel? Well, it, you know, it would be if we had a Congress that is actually working and doing their job. There's too much gridlock in it. And so we need to continue, you know, Iowa's economy depends on these renewable fuel standards. So we need to have them continue. And, and Mr. Young, are you fairly confident that if Congress were in charge of setting the renewable fuel standard, that in fact this is something that, that they would actually want to continue? Um, especially considering the fact that, um, I mean, this is a big, a big interest to Iowa, but it's not necessarily a priority all over the country. It's not necessarily a priority all over the country, but if you look what's happening globally, and if you want to get away from being dependent on Middle East fuels, we're going to have to have a comprehensive energy strategy. We have a Department of Energy, but we don't have an energy policy. And renewable fuels needs to be a part of that. And I'll be at the table to make sure it's there. Let me ask you about a comment you mentioned earlier about one of the problems with our political climate here is all these ads, negative ads. Um, Congress this week um, had an opportunity to vote on a constitutional amendment dealing with the Citizens United ruling in the Supreme Court um, that opened the doors to uh, super PACs, corporate funding uh, of, of campaigns through, not, not of campaigns, but of campaign advertising. Um, would you have voted for that constitutional amendment? And generally, how do you feel about uh, campaign finance reform? Well, when it comes to campaigns and um, fundraising and the FEC, I think we need to make sure we have full transparency. So in the Citizens United case, I believe that it should stand. But I'm need, I think we need to make sure that we know who's funding what uh, and at what level. And their voters, consumers, Americans can make a better judgment on who to vote for or who not vote for, or who's standing behind um, what advocacy and not. Well, do you agree then with the Supreme Court in Citizens United that uh, money from corporations counts as constitutionally protected political speech? I do. And and so I don't want to. You don't want to change that at all. Just report who is giving the money. I'd like to see much. more transparency and oversight. Just and, transparency. And Mrs. Apple, would you have voted uh, to amend the Constitution to deal with the issue that came up in the Citizens United ruling? Absolutely. In the state senate, I put forth two pieces of legislation um, to take money out of politics. Um, there's way too much money in politics. And what, what about the philosophical question? Is campaign money from individuals, does that count as constitutionally protected speech or from corporations? And is there a I do not think a corporation is a person. So I don't think that will be, should be protected. And uh, what would you do with campaign finance? You said uh, you, you proposed legislation to take money out. How so? Well, to limit here in the state of Iowa, um, you, you know, there is no limits for any of the statewide or anything below that. There is no limits. That's just wrong. There has to be limits on how much people can, can contribute to campaigns. Mr. Young, it seems as if there's a limit to some Republicans' tolerance for farm subsidies. At what point would you, as a member of Congress, be able to convince your fellow Republicans that farm subsidies should continue? And uh, can, would you also ever countenance separating the food and nutrition part of the farm bill from the farm policy itself? Well, in the most recent farm bill, uh, there was a reduction in direct payments, so we're making some progress there. And even the Farm Bureau uh, has, has taken a look at this and said maybe it's a good good time to start talking about this and having this conversation. Um, you know, the Farm Bill, 
dollars, I believe it was. You know, 80% of that was the food stamps. Um, the other 20% of that was in the farm programs. Um, we, we have many Iowans uh, who are suffering, who are hungry, who are dependent on those food stamps. Um, I don't like the fact that they're not asset tests necessarily to make sure that people aren't defrauding the program and it's not there for the people who really need it. Uh, but the best way to lower the amount of people who are on food stamps is to make sure we get this economy rolling so there are good jobs out there. How would you uh, make the argument that farm policy should be united with the nutrition aspects of the farm bill? Well, you know, it's been a marriage between the rural uh, folks and the, the more urban centers in our country, and it's, uh, and it's an alliance that they both kind of hold their nose up and hold hands and walk down the aisle and get it passed, and I think they both need each other. But some of your fellow Republicans want to end that alliance. Well, that's where they stand. Uh, Ms. Apple, at what point do you think farmers should get a subsidy to buy insurance, whereas the small business owner on Main Street doesn't get a subsidy to buy insurance for his business? You know, it's, the farming is so important here in the state of Iowa, and the farm bill is critical. It was uh, terrible that we had three years of non-passage of the farm bill. We had to wait. I remember sitting at uh, the dining room table. I've got four children that are a debate. We were talking about non-passage of the farm bill and um, you know why that wasn't working in the gridlock in Congress. And I remember my oldest son saying, Ted saying, Mom, you know, you did so much for the people of Iowa. You should run for Congress. I bet you can get this fixed. Um, and so that's one of the primary reasons I'm running, is to make sure we break up that gridlock and get things passed, like a farm bill. And that, and that includes also guaranteeing some prices, such as for corn, it will be low, it will be below the target price of last March. And so farmers uh, this year will be getting some payments from the government to subsidize that loss. Right. And, and our you farmers, agree with that? Yes. Our farmers need to know how to make their plans for the next, next year, the next two years. And Mr. Young. The farming industry is different than any other. And I believe there, there needs to be a support system, a base support system. Uh, for farmers, it's like going to Las Vegas every day when they wake up regarding the weather. And so they depend on the weather. When it's really bad, there needs to be that support there so that they can make sure that they can do the right things for the next season to make sure we have uh, feed and fuel and food on the table. Speaking of crops, uh, there's a new cash crop in Colorado with the legalization of marijuana, and states around the country are looking at uh, medical marijuana, including Iowa, um, with approving a derivative of marijuana for, for kids with, uh, with epilepsy and other, other disorders. Um, do you, would you, as a member of Congress, consider backing off of the federal laws and, and allow states to make their own decisions um, on uh, how to uh, control and, uh, and distribute marijuana? Commissioner DeVille? Yes. Uh, you know, I look at it as a mom. Um, I, I think uh, any legalization of marijuana I'm not supportive of. I do have a, um, a lot of compassion for these families that are dealing with a child with epilepsy and they're, finding, they're seeing a solution for that. And um, I can see a pathway there. Okay, but I mean, some, some of these state-by-state -state pathways are being hamstrung uh, by the fact that you can't, um, you can't transport this product across state lines. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of federal regulations that um, actually make this difficult. Would, would you, as a congressperson, say, you know, the states know best about, you know, what is right for them? Well, I think Iowa's making, you know, they're working through the problems of it and they're working through the ruling, rule process right now. So I think we have to let the rule process work. Okay, so you leave the, leave, leave the federal law the way it is. At this point, right. And Mr. Young, uh, should the states be able to uh, write their own uh, destiny when it comes to medical marijuana, or, or should you keep uh, the war on drugs laws in place in the federal, federal system? Well, the states are doing it regardless of what the federal law is right now, so that's happening. Um, I have met with parents here in Iowa who have tried every effective means of medicine or therapy to help their child going through epilepsy, um, I want to make sure that they have the most safe and effective products available. If that is medical marijuana, then so be it. But there needs to believe, I believe, to make sure the FDA uh, has a role in this to make sure it's safe and effective. Candidates, we haven't much time left. I do want to mention the Veterans Affairs uh, Administration. Um, would you? allow a veteran to have a voucher and go get medical care anywhere, Mr. Young? And if so, why have the VA? 
I live in Van Meter where the Iowa Veterans Cemetery is. And every day I pass by that exit in that cemetery and I think about the, the men and women who have served our country. And I think about what we have just witnessed uh, with what's been happening in the VA program. And it didn't just happen under this administration. It's been there before. We have a new director there, uh, Secretary McDonald. He's given it 90 days to make sure that they turn things around. But I believe the veterans who put their life on the lines for our freedoms, they should have those vouchers. Uh, Ms. Zappel, would you give veterans a voucher to go get care anywhere? And if so, why have the VA system at all? You know, I've sat down and spoke with veterans, spent time with them. What they really want is us to fix the VA system. They want us to fund the VA system. They want us to streamline the paperwork within it. That's what needs to get fixed. Um, I think we just had, the president just signed into law, if you are 45 miles outside, you can get care right where you're at so you don't have to travel for Several it. Several times tonight, you've mentioned good paying jobs need to be created. What's the single most important thing that you could do as a congresswoman to create good paying jobs? We need to make sure that we fund the Small Business Administration and their loan program. Because small business is what create our best paying jobs. And when they want to expand their business, they need to know that Small Business Administration is funded. Mr. Young, the single most important thing. Uh, go after the U.S. tax code that is 75,000 pages long that complicates the lives of every American. And make the tax code certain and permanent <clears throat> so people can invest in this economy and create jobs. 18 months ago, neither one of you were seeking this office. Um, if you are elected, Mr. Young, how long will you serve? Uh, as long as the people want me and as long as I have the desire. And I want to get there and get things done. Mrs. Apple? Once again, I would probably the same way. It would be there as long as the people will have me. I plan to work hard for the people of Iowa. So neither, way, neither of you would term limit yourself uh, say you know, there's a certain period of time that you I would not do a self-imposed term limit but I do think that term limits is something that needs to be discussed in Congress we have um, you know when I serve on board of directors I don't spend you know I don't want to spend long enough longer years on it because we need Quickly, to bring new Mr. information Young. in uh, I would not self-impose term limits on myself or nor I think elections are term limits uh, what's what, what did you really have to think about is that federal bureaucracy, those government workers work 30, 40, 50 years, and they will outlast uh, I'm time any limited. member of Congress. I'm time limited. I'm sorry. <laughs> and we're out of it. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, this is the third in Iowa Public Television's special election programming, Iowa's most comprehensive statewide debate series as we travel the state from border to border, beginning at the Iowa State Fair with the governor's race, and then it was two weeks ago, the second congressional district candidates debating in Iowa City. So for today, for the entire Iowa Public Television crew, live from the Iowa Western Community College in Council Bluffs, I'm Dean Borg, and thanks for joining us.